Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen Flynn, and I'm the co-executive director of Build Healthy Places Network. And we're a national center fostering collaboration between community development, healthcare, and public health to accelerate community-centered investments in racial equity. And this is our popular video series that provides brief insights into the work of practitioners and organizations from these different fields that are working together to make communities healthier and thinking about advancing racial equity. And our current series focuses on centering community voice and uplifting practices and supports for community engagement processes that are community led and owned. And this discussion today is about the proposed changes to the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that I'll call AFFH from now on that the Department of Housing and Urban Development is soliciting public feedback until October 10th. And we think this is a historic moment that for communities that have faced exclusion, discrimination, to lift up their voices and help shape their own future for housing justice that can impact health. Um, and Build Healthy Places Network created a useful template using policy links, public community guide um, for public health and healthcare organizations to submit comments and it'll be available on our website and in this blog series. And I'm really excited to be joined today by Rashida Phillips. Rashida is the Director of Housing at Policy Link. Welcome, Rashida. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Um, could you share with me a little bit about Policy, Policy Link and your role at the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So Policy Link is a national research and advocacy and action organization. Um, we serve the 100 million who are at or below the poverty line in America. And in my work, I lead Policy Link's national advocacy to support the growing tenant rights, housing and land use movements in partnership with grassroots partners, movement leaders, industry and government leaders. So a lot of that looks like research, um, movement infrastructure, and helping communities to think about policies that will best um, support their communities' access to housing. Thank you, such crucial work. Could you briefly, briefly share the history of the AFFH rule? Yes, absolutely. So folks may be familiar with the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Um, that act prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and finance of dwellings, um, housing, and, and other housing-related transactions on the basis of race, color, gender, sex, religion, familial status, national origin or disability, which is known as the protected classes. But in addition to prohibiting discrimination, the Fair Housing Act also requires um, the Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD, to administer its programs and activities in a manner that affirmatively furthers fair housing. So that's where you get that AFFH um, acronym from, because that mandate is already embedded in the Fair Housing Act. However, um, although that it, it that is in a part of the Fair Housing Act, um, a lot of communities didn't understand what that term meant. What does it mean to affirmatively furthering fair housing because it was never defined in the Fair Housing Act. And so before 2015, before we saw the first AFFH rule come out under the Obama administration, um, HUD did not really um, implement very well that AFFH mandate. It, it required grantees, jurisdictions that receive certain types of HUD funding to certify that they were affirmatively furthering fair housing through a process called the analysis of impediments. However, um, when those reports were submitted, they were often submitted inconsistently by jurisdictions who had to do them, and then they were rarely enforced or looked at by HUD or, or utilized. And so the AFFH rule in, was introduced um, as a regulation to enforce the provisions of the Fair Housing Act that requires governments to take more um, affirmative and meaningful steps, meaningful actions to address patterns of housing discrimination and promote fair housing choice in communities. And under that rule, what communities were required to do in 2015 um, were to start um, doing what was called assessments of fair housing, looking at where there were housing disparities, where there were disparities to access to housing choice, particularly for people who have been historically marginalized or um, kept out of housing, particularly those protected classes that I talked about earlier. And so under that rule with jurisdictions having to do this assessment of fair housing process, they were really able to look at the fair housing conditions um, in their communities specifically and develop goals and strategies that would address those disparities, as well as align federal resources and other resources in their jurisdiction to be able to address those issues. However, unfortunately, that rule was rolled back um, under the Trump administration in 2017. 
Um, but then with the Biden administration, the rule was reinstated in part. And then we now have a new proposed AFFH rule that's hopefully going to reinstate a lot of the mandates from the 2015 rule, a lot of the things that made it work well for communities to start to achieve housing equity. Thanks, Rashida. That was super helpful. Um, I guess my next question is, can you tell us more about how access to fair and affordable housing is important to racial justice and and why in particular are the proposed changes to the AFFH rule important to advancing racial equity and health equity? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I think as many of us know, right, where you live determines your access to jobs. It determines your access to quality education, to transit, to health care. Um, it determines your access to social services, whether you're going to be able to access healthy food, whether you're going to be able to access clean air and water, just to name a few things, right? And so the AFFH rule is necessary because it allows us to think about um, the neighborhoods where the 100 million work, right, the folks who are at or below the poverty line, who are quite often living in or from neighborhoods whose current racial disparities can be traced back to a lot of this, the discriminatory laws and practices of the past, um, right? So AFFH, the rule and the process that's embedded in it allows us to take a look at it. It allows us to take a look at how our neighborhoods are constructed and how people are being kept out of um, healthy lives, healthy communities, right? And so it's, it's one rule that allows us to look at that. And again, by um, requiring and pushing jurisdictions to set concrete goals and metrics. We create stronger accountability structures for folks to be able to advocate and push the policies that they know will work in our communities. Um, and so also just, you know, when we think about health equity, we achieve health equity um, when everyone, regardless of race, neighborhood, or financial status, has a fair and just opportunity for health, um, whether that's physical, mental, economic, and social um, health, right? And so thinking about the, the inextricable link between race and health equity and how that is often determined by, again, where we live and what we have access to. Um, the AFFH rule and the planning process that's involved with it allows us to really take a deep dive and again, to craft strategies and goals that are going to support our local communities and being able to achieve, um, uh, advance some of the um, strategies that they know will work for their communities. Thank you, thank you. And then the last question is just how can other organizations that are interested in health and racial equity engage in this process? Yeah, so there's a number of ways. Um, right now, there's an opportunity with the new proposed AFFH rule to submit comments. Um, and the public comment process for that rule is open until April 10th. And so reviewing that rule and just taking a look at what it says about um, the connections between these issues of race, health equity, and, and other, other issues of equity, right? Um, whether you're disabled, right? Um, the, the sort of intersectional issues, being able to uplift those in your comments is going to be really helpful. And then even beyond the AFFH comment period, right, because it's going to take a little bit of time before the rule to be finalized, there may be things that get changed in the rule, hopefully it becomes stronger because of our comments on it. But I really encourage folks to even beyond that process, get involved in fair housing issues in your community, understand what fair housing looks like, and what are the systems and processes that support fair housing access in your community, because this is something that we have to be paying attention to year round, regardless of if there's a rule or there's an opportunity to comment, fair housing is, is a condition that folks have to deal with every single day. And so understanding what the fair housing ecosystem looks like in your community and getting involved in that process. And then once we have a final rule that will help facilitate how that rule gets implemented, right? When you, when you all can come together at the same table and say, look, as healthcare providers, as folks who are um, part of the public health system, it's important that we be talking about housing and that we be providing solutions and input on, on what it looks like for folks to have access to housing because we know of those ties between health and housing access. So that's what I would say. I would say get involved beyond the AFFH, but we, we have an immediate opportunity to comment and make that rule stronger and make sure that equity is infused throughout the entire rule and that it's an accessible rule that communities will be able to use. Thank you, Rashida. As Rashida said, get in, you can get involved by public comment by April 10th, and then beyond that, get involved in fair housing in your communities. And Rashida, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.